Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Thank you for joining the Kubernetes Day on Google Open Source Live. This is a monthly series of sessions led by open source ex experts from Google. And uh, for today, Kubernetes community members. Now, we really appreciate everyone taking the time to come here together digitally to learn a little bit more about, you know, really what makes Kubernetes tick. With that, my name is Bob Killen, also known as Mr. Bobby Tables across all the things. I'm a program manager here at Google and a member uh, within the Kubernetes project. Right now, uh, I'm, I live just outside Ann Arbor, and it was snowy earlier, uh, but today it's, it's a little bit warmer, so things are good. It's just a little bit cool. And hello, everyone. I'm Kaslyn Fields, and I'm a developer advocate here at Google Cloud. I'm also a member of the Kubernetes Special Interest Group for Contributor Experience. And I'm based out of the Seattle area, where things are actually looking pretty nice and sunny today, though it's a bit chilly at 35 degrees at 9 AM. So. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Tim. I work on Kubernetes and GKE at Google. Uh, I'm currently in Sunnyvale, California, where it's what Californians think of as pretty darn cold, and Midwesterners like Bob probably think of as shorts weather. We have some really interesting topics today. If you're looking to learn more about some of the internals, what makes Kubernetes tick, you're in the right place. We'll kick it off with a talk from Kevin Delgado, walking us through the life of a Kubernetes API request from start to finish. Now, but before that, we have a couple housekeeping items I need to go over quick first. Uh, don't forget to put your questions in the live Q&A forum below the live stream window. Uh, if you're viewing in full screen, you'll actually need to exit out to see the, the Q&A. Um, our sessions have been pre-recorded to uh, allow the like accurate transcription as well as allowing the speakers to focus on answering your questions live as they come up. Once we're done, don't forget to join us in the after party today on Google Meet. We will share a link to that uh, at the end of the last session. With that, enjoy. Hey there, I'm Kevin Delgado, a software engineer that works on open source Kubernetes here at Google. And today I'm gonna to take us through the life of a Kubernetes API request. The main focus here is to understand what happens when you type kube control create and pass in a Kubernetes object with the dash F flag. For example, what happens when you call create and pass in a YAML file with a single replica set object? This is targeted at people with some familiarity using kube control. And so while you might know what should happen when you run this command, maybe you haven't spent much time trying to understand how it actually happens. Here's the big overview of the main components we'll be looking at as we dive through the life of an API request. As alluded to before, our journey begins in the kube control command line tool. For many, this is the primary entry point for interacting with a Kubernetes cluster. From here, our kube control command gets packaged up into an HTTP request that gets sent over the wire to the kube API server. The API server sits at the core of the Kubernetes cluster in the control plane and is responsible for serving all requests for the many Kubernetes resources that a cluster maintains. The persistence of Kubernetes objects is handled by the key value store etcd. This is where the API server stores, in our case, the replica set object it has created. If you're familiar with Kubernetes, noticeably absent from this picture is any mention of the controllers that operate on objects once they're created the nodes that actually run the containerized workloads, and many other components of the Kubernetes ecosystem. Those are all outside the scope of this talk, as we really want to focus and dive deep on the path an API request takes through the system. A fair warning that we are going to be taking a look at some of the source code that makes up each of these components. For clarity and brevity, the code is highly edited to emphasize the key pieces. At the top of each snippet is a path where you can find it in source. We're going to be looking at code from Kubernetes version 1.19.2. I'm well aware that a slide deck is not the best format to view code in, but looking at the code really is one of the best ways 
to trace through what happens to an API request. So starting with the kube control binary, the few big points we'll touch on here are the setup around creating the kube control CLI command, the actual execution of that command, the way in which we create an HTTP request and execute that request, sending to the ACE, sending to the API server, and lastly, the client-side serialization that takes place to encode the body of the request into a format that we can send across the wire that the API server can understand. The first thing that happens when you run any kube control command is that all of the kube control commands get built. Kube control uses a, CLI, a Go CLI command library called Cobra. And in the example on the left, we see that to build the specific kube control create command, we generate a new Cobra command populating some of the documentation fields with things like what help info we want to get from the command, but most importantly, telling it how to run via its run field. And when this is invoked, it, it, it calls a method run create on some options, passing in something called a factory. What is this factory? Well, it's basically some drop in abstractions that are used when executing kube control. For example, we use the factory to get the various clients, such as the rest client we need to make rest calls. But we also use this factory to retrieve something called a builder that we'll take a look at next. That run create call we saw in the run method of the Cobra command is what gets called when we want to execute the kube control create command. After doing some initial setup, the factory creates a builder. Now what this builder is responsible for is taking the data that you pass in via the dash F or dash K flags, which is usually a YAML file of one or more Kubernetes objects, unpacks it, and turns it into an iterable list of objects that for each object will have a generic rest operation performed on it. This happens by calling visit, on the resource created by the builder, and for each resource it visits, which in our case might just be the one replica set, if that's all we passed in via the dash F flag. And for each resource, it creates something called a helper and then calls the generic create on that helper with the object in question. The helper is just a structure that helps, that provides methods for running generic RESTful operations. It has methods post, get, list, delete, etc., that all map to corresponding HTTP operations. This helper executes the HTTP request. In the case of a post request, like we see here, a big part of that is building the body of the request, and we'll take a look at that next. As we saw, the helper uses its REST client to build and execute a post request. The REST client lives in Client Go, which is the same Go library that you would use if building some external program to interact with the Kubernetes cluster. Prior to sending the, prior to sending the request, it builds the body of the request from an object into the format that gets sent across the wire and understood by the API server. As you can see, the REST client accepts a number of formats, string, bytes, IO reader, but if you're using the helper like we're doing here, then the body is going to be created from a Go Kubernetes object in memory and must be serialized into the proper wire format. For that, we'll take a look at some interfaces from the API machinery runtime package in just a moment. The last step is to actually send the HTTP request across the wire, which, which it does via the do method using a vanilla go HTTP client. That then gets the response back from the server and bubbles it up to the user in the format outputted by the specific kube control command. Here, we see the interfaces for serialization that get implemented by auto-generated API machinery code. This serializer interface is just an encoder and a decoder. And as you might expect, the encoder is responsible for converting a Kubernetes object go struct in memory into the canonical wire format to send across the network to the API server. And likewise, the decoder takes that wire format and converts it back into a Kubernetes object in Go that lives in memory. A few really interesting things happens here though. First of all, Kubernetes accepts multiple wire types, JSON and Protobo. You'll notice the negotiated serializer, which like the regular serializer offers encoding and decoding, but serves as an abstraction around the multiple supported media types. So not only in JSON and Protobo, but also but also some more encoding options like content type header or JSON pretty printing. You'll also notice the encoder four version, version and decoder two version, where we can get an encoder or decoder that are, that are aware of how to serialize for a specific object version. Further, you'll see that a codec is the exact same interface as a serializer. The difference is that under the hood, a serializer will not modify the Kubernetes object being encoded or decoded while a codec can. This is useful for understanding when when looking at how the API server handles the request it receives. This serialization library straddles both the kube control client and the API server, and on the server side, is responsible not only for decoding the wire format into a ghost struct, but also for converting the object to the right version and defaulting any fields the server requires. 
The idea behind conversion is that other clients is that older clients are expected to be able to communicate with new API servers. In order for these older clients to continue to work, the codec can encode or decode an object to or from a different version. So something like so something that is v1 on the wire could be v2 in memory or vice versa. There's also the concept of an internal version so that the server or storage clients only need to know how to deal with a single version and the codec can convert from one version to the internal version and the back to a different version if needed. Similarly, older clients may not be aware of new API fields, and yet these API fields might be mandatory or only accept certain values. With this machinery, newer API servers are able to default those fields on requests that come in from older clients that might have the fields absent. Finally, when we talk about the ghost struct of a Kubernetes object, what we're talking about is a ghost structure that satisfies the runtime.object interface. That means that all Kubernetes API objects, replica sets, pods, services, etc., must implement this interface. You'll see this runtime object type all throughout the code. This interface used to be just one function called is a runtime object that didn't do anything other than signal if a struct was an API object. Now, there are a couple functions that help remove some of the need for reflection and makes operation of the API machinery code much more efficient. So that's it for the cube control client. Now that we have a request on the wire, it's time to take a look at what happens server side. Within the cube API server, we'll take a look at the API server aggregation layer and then see how the API server gets set up and configures routing and dispatching to the right endpoint. And then we'll take a look at the business logic of how the request is actually handled. And lastly, we'll dive into how the newly created object is persisted to etcd. The way the cube API server gets started is actually itself a Cobra command too. Like all Cobra commands, it has a run function that is called when executed. This run function kicks off a helper function that creates the server chain. The server chain aggregates an extension server with the cube API server. The API server aggregation is fairly new to Kubernetes and provides some pretty nifty customization. Aggregated API servers let you do things with your API server that you wouldn't be able to achieve out of the box or even with custom resources, such as using a different storage API instead of etcd. That aside though, for creating a simple replica set, all we really need is a cube API server. The cube API server that gets created holds all its state in a struct called a generic API server. In addition to a lot of state, uh, to a lot of state in creating generic API, the generic state API server initializes the handler chain, which is a series of HTTP middlewares that every request goes through that is responsible for various things such as authorization, cores, timeouts, or max and flights, and a handful of other functions. Additionally, we call install API on the server so that we can serve requests for all the various Kubernetes resources consistently. This API installation sets up the routing and dispatch so that request URLs get sent to the correct resource handlers. We'll take a look at routing and dispatch in a bit, but first we'll see how the API server actually starts serving. The generic API server exposes a run method that gets ran when the API server is invoked. This sets up a shutdown delay so that the server can gracefully shut down when terminated and calls serve on the server's secure serving info, which sets up TLS and finally invoke serve on a vanilla Go HTTP server, which is the entry point for the socket to actually start listening and serving. Circling back to routing and dispatch that we mentioned earlier, we use an API installer to register the actual HTTP handlers that process the request that comes in. That install H API method that we saw earlier uh, called when creating the generic API server uses a library called Go RESTful for setting up a muxer that matches the request path with its proper handler. The way we configure the Go RESTful muxer is by starting with something called an API group version struct. API resources in Kubernetes are divided by group version. This indicates to the API installer which path these resources live at. It contains a variety of useful fields, like a negotiated serializer for encoding and decoding into and from the various formats, as well as something called a storage, which performs the various REST operations and wraps the actual client used to write to storage. When we use the API group version to register the resource handlers, we program Go RESTful to link a resources path to its handler for every given HTTP verb, along with some other things like giving us auto-generated open API documentation. The register resource handler snippet you see on the right-hand side is actually a huge several hundred line long function. As the snippet indicates, there's a switch statement with a case per HTTP verb that sets up a route to the given handler. So all we've seen so far is what gets ran when the API server binary is started. 
We're done with that now, and we've finally made it to the code that runs when an actual request comes through. Here in the create handler is what the HTTP is where the HTTP request gets handled. As you can see, we're using the decoder we've seen previously. This decodes the body from the wire format into the correct version of the Go runtime object struct in memory that we pass on to storage. Another interaction that takes place here are the calls out to the admission webhooks. Admission webhooks are calls that the API server makes to external servers that perform an action on the object being handled by the API server. There are two kinds of admission webhooks, mutating webhooks and validating webhooks. The mutating admission webhook gets called first and modifies the incoming object, such as by adding custom defaults or annotations. And then right before storing to etcd, the object is passed to the validating admission webhook. This can reject requests based on custom policies external to the API server. Lastly, we actually persist the object to storage in etcd before returning the response of the request up the call stack. How this object gets persisted to storage is what we'll look at next. So take note here that it's under create call on something called a named creator. The last part of our journey here, we'll dive deep into how we go from the request handler processing the request body into the final state of the Kubernetes object to be stored and persisting and persisting that object to etcd. As mentioned previously, the request handler calls the create method on a named creator to pers persist the Kubernetes object to etcd. The named creator and the more generic creator are interfaces that map to the corresponding HTTP create method. There exists interfaces for each of the restful verbs, get, watch, create, delete, update, that act on a single item, as well as a separate set of interfaces for each of these verbs that act on a collection of items. Implementing this interface is not trivial though. And on top of that, there's a lot of shared functionality between how the create method should work across all resource types, but there are also some differences. To take away some of this complexity, there's a built-in implementation called a store that in addition to holding the actual etcd client to fire off etcd transactions, takes in a strategy for each type of rest action that is specific to the resource being operated on. On the right-hand side, we see how the store implements create. Utilizing the create strategy, prior to actually executing the transaction. Thus, no matter what kind of object you are creating, it runs this create method that really only differs by the create strategy it uses for the specific object type. It then generates the etcd key before finally writing to etcd and calling after create on the object that has just been persisted. Before looking at the etcd3 storage client that executes the transaction, we'll take a brief look at the create strategy specific to the replica set resource. In general, a REST create strategy must implement the methods you see on the left. These are slightly different for each resource type, but as you can see in the unedited prepare for create and validate methods on the right, the specific strategy for a resource is pretty trivial, as it should be in order to support the many different resource types that Kubernetes has. And the bulk of the work is done on the store that we just looked at previously. One aspect that we glossed over when going through API server setup was how the actual replica set strategy is installed on the cluster. Taking a brief step back, during API server setup, the generic API server is wrapped in something called control plane instance. This instance has an install APIs method on it that confusingly is different than the install API method on the API installer to set up routing and dispatch. This method wires together all the REST storage providers for every API group, such as auto scaling batch, and of course, the apps group, which is where the replica set storage provider lives. This is where we configure the storage options and set the replica set strategy that we took a look at on the last slide. Finally, the very last piece of code we'll look at is how the store uses the actual etcd3 client to execute the etcd request. Once again, we use a codec from the API machinery runtime package that is embedded into the encode call. While an API server can handle requests for many different versions, it writes all objects to storage as a single version. This enables more control over storage format upgrades and lets you roll back or roll forward versions. Here, the codec does that conversion before finally executing and committing the transaction and surfacing up any errors. And that's it. I hope you've gotten a better picture of now what happens when you make a Kubernetes API request, starting with the invocation of a kube control command and it's building an execution of an HTTP request that gets sent to the kube API server, handled, and turned into an object persisted to etcd. Thanks for taking the time to watch.
Thanks, Kevin. The API server is critical to everything we do with Kubernetes. So getting a stronger understanding of how it works is sure to mobile, no matter how you work with this. So if you have questions for Kevin in below, make sure you get those questions answered. And to make things a little more interesting and interactive, we'd like to hear from you. We're going to be putting up a poll for you to answer, so be sure to check it out. The question is, how many KubeCons have you been to? Zero, one, two or three, or four plus? <laughs> Next, we'll hear from CC Huang about webhooks and Kubernetes. So take it away. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming to Google Open Source. I'm Thesi Huang, and I'm currently working at Google as a software engineer. Today, the topic is admission webhooks. Put the power in your hands. First, let's take a look at today's agenda. We are going to talk about what are admission webhooks, why people need admission webhooks, and how to config a custom admission webhook, some best practices when you think about your use case and configurations and then the way to monitor your admission webhooks behavior. And at last, we will have a short demo. So let's first take a look at what are admission webhooks. Here is an overview of the API request lifecycle. To understand the admission webhooks, first, we need to understand what is the admission procedure in Kubernetes. An admission controller is a piece of code that intercepts requests to the Kubernetes API server prior to persistence of the object, but after the request is authenticated and authorized. Kubernetes ships with a lot of admission controllers, and there are 17 of them are enabled by default in v1.19. A lot of things which we assume are native to Kubernetes are actually done by those admission controllers. And they can be turned on with the Kubernetes API server flag enable-admission plugins. Let's take a look at some admission controllers as examples, which are shaped with Kubernetes. Here is a namespace lifecycle controller. And when the request come in, try to create a deployment with the name my deploy in the namespace test. And if the test namespace currently in on terminating status, there's no point to create a new deployment. So the namespace lifecycle controller will simply just fill the request and return to the user. Another example will be the always pull images controller. They will check the image pull policy and update it to be always if it was not. As we can see here, the admission controllers can be categorized into two types, mutating admission controllers and validating admission controllers. And some may be both. Mutating controllers may modify the objects they admit Validating controllers may not. The admission controller process proceeds in two phases. In the first phase, mutating admission controllers are run. And in the second phase, validating admission controllers are run. If any of the controllers in either phase reject the request, the entire request is rejected immediately and an error is returned to the end user. Among those admission controllers shipped with Kubernetes, to take a special role because of their nearly limitless flexibility. Mutating admission webhooks and validating admission webhooks. 
they do not implement any policy decision logic themselves. Instead, the respective action is obtained from a REST endpoint of a service running inside of the cluster. This approach decouples the admission controller logic from the Kubernetes API server, thus allowing users to implement customer logic to be executed whenever resources are created, updated, or deleted in a Kubernetes cluster. The difference between the two kinds of admission controller webhooks is pretty much self-explanatory. Mutating admission webhooks are mu may mutate the objects, while validating admission webhooks may not. And mutating admission webhooks are called in serial, while validating admission webhooks are called in parallel. So why do we need admission webhooks? The, ad the admission webhooks um, can help in certain area. So they can help um, they can help with increasing security by mandating a reasonable security baseline across the entire namespace or cluster. For example, uh, we can only allow pulling image from 30 re registry inside your corporation, and we can disallow containers from running as root. And secondly, we can help to enforce the adherence to certain practices, such as having good labels, annotations, resource limits, or other settings. Like we can enforce some label validation or add annotations to objects, like add a cost center. Cost center. And uh, third, they can help with configuration management. For example, we can add resources limits or validating resources limits. And also, we can ensure image references used in production deployments are not using the latest tags. Then. How can we configure our admission webhooks? Before we take a deep look at the configuration fields, there are some prerequisites uh, we'd better keep in mind while using the admission webhooks. First, we always have to check the community cluster versions. It has to be at least a V1.16 for using admission registration.kubernetes.io slash V1, and it should be at least a V1.9 to use the admission registration.kubernetes.io um, slash v1 beta 1. And we also have to ensure that mutating admission webhook and validating admission webhook admi uh, admission controllers are enabled by the flag we talked earlier. And also, we should ensure that the API is enabled. Here is an example of a validating webhook configuration. I will not go through all the fields in the detail. Basically, it's a validation webhook configuration. It only contains one webhook with the name pod-policy.example.com with the rule triggered on every namespace pod creation request. The client config tells API server how to contact the webhook. And this webhook does not have any side effects, and it has five seconds timeout for the API server to call the webhook. There are some other optional fields you can set, which does not show here. We will talk about them in more details in the following slides. And there are always some best practices recommended in terms of thinking about your use case or think about how to configure your own webhook. The first one is add importance. What is add importance? Add importance is like it. Um, after applied multiple times, the state, the status, the result, and all the and the side effects should be exactly the same as being applied once. So here is an example of an important mutating animation webhooks. Always pull images. So when I, like a, um, no matter how many times it's been called, it will always check the image pull policy field and update it to be always if it was not. Another example shows a non-item potency mutating admission webhooks, which is try to inject the sidecar with the timestamp in the name. So when it's being called at the first time, it will inject, it will append a sidecar container in your container list with the current timestamp in the name. But when it's being called the second time, it will append another sidecar container into your containers list with the timestamp which might uh, not be something the users wanted. 
So why we want the uh, mutating webhook to be item potent? Because mutating webhook may be called twelve by the API server. A single ordering of mutating admission plugins just does not work for all cases because some other admission controllers may mutate the object and the decision may be different depending on the order. Let's take a look at an example. Here in the example, we try to inject the sidecar and when this controller being called, a sidecar container being appended into the port. And then uh, always port images being called so we will go ahead and check the image port policy to all the containers and update them to be always. But what if the order is different? If we first call the always port images, which will update our image port policy to be always. And then the inject sidecar being called. So it will try to append a sidecar with the name sidecar in the containers list but the image port policy is not set to be always, which against our expectation. So we try to apply the best effort reinvocation mechanism by setting, by allowing uh, to set the reinvocation policy field to be if needed. So in the previous case, we the inject sidecar being called and they ingested a sidecar container into the container list. And then the always port images uh, is allowed to be called twelve and updated the image port policy to be always, which meet the expectation. And the second uh, um, best practice is intercepting all versions of an object. We all know that Kubernetes support multiple API versions. For example, Kube API server allows creating, updating deployments while extension slash v1 beta 1 apps slash v1 beta 1, apps slash v1 beta 2, and apps slash v1 APIs. If a webhook is configured to only intercept the deployments requests in apps slash v1, it will miss requests in the other versions. It is recommended that admission webhooks should always intercept all versions of an object by setting the match policy field to be equivalent. It is also recommended that admission webhooks should prefer registering for stable versions of resources. And failure to intercept all versions of an object can result in admission policies not being enforced for requests in 30, in 30 versions. The next best practice is availability. The time calling webhook builds up time completing the entire API request. So it's always recommended that animation webhooks should evaluate as quickly as possible, and it's encouraged to use a small timeout for webhooks. In this example, the validating animation webhook sets a two seconds timeout. If the webhook is being slow and doesn't respond in two seconds, the API server will either reject the request or ignore the failure based on the failure policy set. The next, next best practice is guaranteeing the final state of the object is seen. If you use a mutating webhook to enforce security policy, make sure to use a validating webhook to ensure that because another webhook may be invoked after your uh, admission webhook being called. And then uh, the next best practice is avoiding deadlocks in self-hosted webhooks. So a webhook running inside the cluster might cause deadlocks for its own deployment if it is configured to intercept resources required to start its own ports. Let's take a deep let's take an example. A mutating admission webhook is configured to admit create port request only if a certain label is set in the port. In this case, we require the environment label to be set to production. The webhook server runs in a deployment which doesn't set the environment label to be production. And then a node that runs the webhook server ports become unhealthy. The webhook deployment will try to reschedule the ports to another node. However, the requests will get rejected by the existing webhook server since the environment label is not set correctly and the migration cannot happen. So 
We recommend it to exclude the namespace where your webhook is running by setting the namespace selector fields. And another best practice is side effects. Always try to avoid side effects if possible. And if it cannot be avoided, don't trigger the side effect in dry run by set the, by set the side effects uh, field to be none on dry run. And the last best practice is avoiding operating on the kubesystem namespace. The kubesystem namespace contains objects created by the Kubernetes system, like service accounts for um, control plane components, ports like kubedns. Accidentally mutating or rejecting requests in the kubesystem namespace may cause the control plane components to stop functioning or introduce unknown behavior. If your admission webhooks don't intend to modify the behavior of the Kubernetes control plane. Exclude the cube system namespace from being uh, intercepted using a namespace selector field. Here is an example. Only match the request in a namespace which the rule level value is not equal to zero or one. It also helps with efficiency since we mentioned earlier that every webhook invocation latency builds up the entire API request latency. By excluding the kubesystem namespace, the webhook invocation is scoped to only what it needed. Next, let's talk about the ways to monitor admission webhook behavior. There are some questions. The, uh, the answers to certain questions can definitely help us to monitor the admission webhook behavior, like which mutating webhook mutated the object in API request? What change did the mutating webhook apply to the object? Or which objects are frequently rejecting API requests? And what's the reason for rejection? The API uh, server provides two ways, uh, two main ways to monitor. The first is through auditing. Cube API server performs auditing on each mutating webhook invocation. Each invocation generates an auditing annotation capturing if the request object is mutated by the invocation and optionally generates an annotation capturing the applied patch from the webhook admission response. For the um, audit level metadata or higher, an annotation with the key mutation.webhook.admission.kubernetes.io slash round with round index, index with order index gets logged. Uh, with JSON payload indicating a uh, webhook gets invoked for given request and uh, whether it mutated the object or not. The example on the left uh, shows an annotation gets recorded for webhook being invoked in the first round and the webhook is ordered the first in the mutating webhook chain and uh, mutated the request object during the invocation. For the um, audit level request or higher, an annotation with key patch.webhook.animation.kubernetes.io slash round with round index, index with order index gets logged with JSON payload indicating a webhook gets invoked for given request and what patch gets applied to the request object. If we take a look at the um, right example, the annotation gets recorded for webhook being re-invoked. The webhook is ordered the first in the mutating webhook chain and responded with a JSON patch, which got applied to the request body, request object. And we can also monitor the webhook by the metrics endpoint. There are two metrics which highly related with the animation webhooks. The first is a API, uh, API server admission webhook admission duration seconds, which is a, histor a histogram matrix, tells you um, how long the uh, webhook admission uh, takes. And the second is the API server admission webhook rejection count, which is a counter matrix, grouped by name, operation type, error type, rejection code. And below are the examples of how the matrix log look like. And now um, let's take a look at a short demo. So the demo use case is fairly simple. We want to have a validating admission webhook, which could ensure ports run as a non-root user. Uh, 
I have four, four uh, examples of ports try to be created. The first one uh, without the um, run as non root being set at all. And the second one, we set the run as non root to be false. The third one, we even we set the run as non root to be true, but we are giving a admin user. The third one with the run as non root to be true and uh, with a given user as one, two, three. So the Kubernetes API should reject the first three requests and only allow the last one to be passed. And uh, here is our validating webhook configuration, which we have uh, one webhook called kubernetes-validation-webhook.demo.com. And uh, um, for all the post creation requests um, happening in the namespace, uh, which has the webhook label to be enabled, and uh, here is the um, error. Here is the API behavior returned when we try to create the pause. And uh, I will not uh, do a live demo in this talk, but I have all the demo code uploaded into the GitHub. If anyone has, in, if anyone is interested, please feel free to take a look. That's the end of the talk. Thank you. Thanks, Cece. I hope everyone sees the power that webhooks offer. Whether you're trying to secure your clusters or building entirely new APIs on top of Kubernetes, webhooks are a really important part of the solution. We've seen the rise of operators in the last couple of years, and webhooks are really central to that idea. It's been great so far building up our understanding of how the Kubernetes API machinery works and how all of these things fit together. When we talk about Kubernetes, we often hear the word declarative. It's an important aspect of our system and how it's all designed. One of the things we haven't yet seen is how to take advantage of the declarative nature of Kubernetes. Next up, we'll hear from Antoine Pelisse about how apply works, including the newest work on server-side apply. Take it away, Antoine. Welcome, uh, my name is Antoine Dolis and I'm a software engineer at Google and I'm going to talk to you today about how Apply works and doesn't and how hopefully server-side Apply will save us all. So today I'm going to talk about uh, declarative configuration a lot because I think it's very, very important to how Kubernetes works and how foundational it is to its success and how it's going to be successful in the future. And so after describing what declarative configuration is, I'm going to talk to you about the implementation that we have in uh, kubectl, which is how we initially implemented uh, the mechanism. And then I'm going to talk about some of the limitations that we found and how we tried to solve them with server-side apply. Uh, so what is declarative configuration and why is it so important? Um, I think Brian Grant described it very well in 2014 when he said that we want to support management of services via declarative configuration. I, I want to show that uh, this is foundational to Kubernetes. This is back in the days, very at the very beginning of the project in 2014. And this is key to Kubernetes and how it's configured. Um, in my opinion, Kubernetes is not just about configuring workloads on the cloud. It's very much about how configuration works and how you decide what you want the system to look like. Um, and so I'm going to focus on that specifically today. So what's declarative configuration? Um, 
we can see on the, on the left, we have a configuration written as YAML. Um, and this is declarative. Why is it declarative? It's declarative because uh, we do not specify how uh, the number of replicas, for example, in this uh, example, is supposed to change, but we describe what the value should be. So if your system has currently one pod and we apply this configuration, we know that we want to increase the number of pods by two. But this is not how we describe it. We don't describe the fact that you have to increase the number of replicas by two. We describe the fact that we want to have three. And this is very important. Um, this is very important for many reasons. One of them is that this is repeatable. We can do the same thing again and again and again without knowing about the existing context of the cluster. And so this is going to apply to any cluster in the exact same way. So for example, if you want to recover from a broken cluster, uh, you're going to just have to reapply that configuration that you know works well, and it's going to go back to that state that you know is good. Uh, if you want to share the configuration with someone, uh, they can apply the configuration and they're going to have the same state, or at least they should have the same state. Um, it's very, very typical for people in companies to want to create testing environments, and they usually want their environments to be very similar uh, for production and testing so that they know they're testing the right thing. And so, again, repeating the production cluster into a test cluster is very, very convenient and frequent. Um, migrations, obviously, if you want to migrate from one cloud provider or from one cluster to another, that's very convenient that this is repeatable. Um, because this is text and because this is easy to read, it's very easy to review and commit to a Git repository. So this is very much done for the uh, GitHub workflows where you push the change to a Git repository and then it's reviewed by, uh, by your peers. Uh, it's easy to review because we don't, again, we don't care about the context or the current state of the cluster. We only care about what you want. Uh, you want three replicas. Is that a good value or not? Uh, the person who reviews doesn't need to know anything else that is this the value uh, you want. And it's also easy for tools to validate, for example, because they can just pass this file, uh, look at the value of replicas, and make sure that it validates a specific policy. So you could have a policy that says, we must have the number of replicas bigger than three and less than 10. And here it's very easy to write a tool that is going to pass this YAML, look at the number of replicas, and make sure that it uh, validates that policy. Uh, because it's repeatable, it's also very easy to roll back. Um, and uh, Git typically provides this kind of workflow. So you just have to reverse your commit, go back to a state that you know works well, and hopefully everything is going to go back to uh, a good state that we know works. Um, I'm going to emphasize specifically that this is what I call data. And why do I call this data rather than uh, code, for example? is that this is very easy to parse, deserialize, and serialize in any common language. Um, if we were to use uh, Python for the configuration, I claim that it would be much harder for any language to be able to parse that. It's very difficult in any language, and let's say JavaScript, for example, to parse Python, look for the replicas field, see that the value is actually a statement, which may be a function, for example. And then if you want to see what the value is, you have to evaluate this statement, which you can do in JavaScript if the statement is Python. There is no uh, Python parser written in every language that we know of. But there is a parser uh, for YAML, hopefully in most languages. Uh, and it's they're usually very easy to use. And changing a single value is uh, typically very easy. Uh, so now if you want to write a tool that is going to look for this value, it's, it's much easier than if the, if the configuration was written as Python or any other language, to be honest. Typically, languages are not easy to parse. Um, this is very convenient for collaboration uh, because we want people to collaborate on their configuration and we want people to collaborate with machines on their configuration. And so we want people and tools to be able to look at the config make changes, validate, update as needed, based maybe on a state that could be continuously reconciled. And so an example of that would be a uh, horizontal pod autoscaler, which would look at the state of your cluster and update 
the value of replicas based on the workload on the cluster to uh, uh, suit the current needs. Um, there are challenges with declarative configuration though. Um, there is no typically endpoint uh, in CRUD APIs for declarative endpoints. You can create, you can read, you can update, you can delete, but there is no way to say, hey, this is what I want. This is what I care about. Just do, do the right thing, do what I need. There is no such thing with CRUD APIs. So one example of that is that we don't know if the resource needs to be created or updated. You have to look, does this resource exist? If it doesn't, then I'm going to create it, but then you can have a race condition. Uh, this is much more complicated than it looks. Um, if you want to update the resource now, it's difficult because typically update in a CRUD API is going to replace uh, the entire object. And if you only care about specific fields, and because we want it to be collaborative, uh, you probably only care about some specific fields. Maybe some controllers care about other values in the same object. So we never want to replace the entire uh, object. So we want to merge them. Uh, for that, we have patch. Uh, but patch is very imperative in nature. You have to look specifically at the changes that you want to make and then apply them. There is chess and merge path, patch that does that, but it doesn't very, work very well in lists. Uh, Kubernetes has tons of lists. For many reasons, it uses associative list, as you know. Uh, this is the type of list where the name is actually the key. They'll map hidden inside a list. Uh, and JSON merge patch just replaces list altogether. If you want, if you apply a list in JSON merge patch, it's going to replace the entire list. So if a controller has added anything to the list, it's going to be overridden. Um, so all of that to say that basically it's very hard not to hinder collaboration uh, when creating such a system. The initial implementation of kubectl apply is written on the client and tries to address some of these challenges. Um, here we can see from this tweet uh, that kubectl apply is the solution to uh, what I just described. It's the declarative configuration tool. It allows you to repeat, you can take a cluster, make some changes, apply them to a different cluster, and hopefully everything is going to just work. Um, this is uh, obviously very different from reality where you have storage and clusters are typically slightly different from each other. Uh, so you need to have some adjustments, but basically this is the idea. It's still much easier than taking a lot of code to generate the config and make sure that it applies properly to a different context. So how does this work? Um, how do we apply? We do apply by running kubectl apply uh, command, the, the command, and you can apply these to many configurations. This is convenient because, again, we don't have to look at each individual configuration and decide if they need to be uh, created or updated. Um, this is obviously not meant at all for uh, imperative commands, like you can't apply a charge credit card or open this door. Though, if you wanted to do open doors, you could rephrase this and say door open, and that would be either true or false, and this would automatically become declarative. Um, this is much more collaborative too, because it allows to change only specific fields uh, rather than replacing the entire object. Uh, we'll see in the next slide, but basically, kubectl apply sends a patch, and it's literally trying to look at each individual fields see which ones have changed and update the object by sending a patch to change these values. Um, the way it decides on what has changed and what needs to change is based on what you had applied before. And so for that, we save uh, the object the way you had it before in the object itself uh, under this uh, last applied annotation. So as you can see here, we have the entire object that we've seen before inside the annotation saved in the object. This is literally how we save the uh, old configuration in Kubernetes with kubectl apply. How does it work? So we can see on the left that we get the object from the server. Uh, and we can see that the number of replicas is five. The image is uh, nginx 142 and it has a sidecar container. And I've removed the details of the sidecar because they're not relevant here. Uh, but we can see that there is a sidecar. And we can see the before, which is coming from the annotation, um, that we have three replicas before, 
And so probably someone must have changed that value since we applied last time. And uh, the image hasn't changed. We can also see that we didn't apply the sidecar initially. So someone must have an opinion about this sidecar, but it's definitely not us. And then we can see what is being applied now in the third column. Uh, we still want three replicas and we want to update the image to the Nginx image to 114.3. Um, we are going to look at these three different objects, the current version, the before version, and the applied version, and we're going to perform a three-way merge. Um, we're going to compute this new final object, which has the number of replicas equal three, which is the value that you said you wanted. Uh, we're going to update the image to Nginx 114.3 as you wanted, and we're going to conserve the sidecar container because you don't have an opinion about that, so we don't believe that it should be removed. Once we have this new object, we are going to compare it with the existing object, compute the difference, and send that difference as a patch uh, to the server. All of that sounds good, but uh, obviously there are limitations with this uh, system. The patch that we use to send to Kubernetes has been made by the Kubernetes community as the needs were coming. We made it uh, in a very homegrown way without thinking about all the problems we could have with that. And obviously we missed many use cases and um, it became insanely hard to update. So one of the problems with the patch strategy that we created that is called a strategic merge patch is that um, if we need to make an update to the strategic merge patch, we don't have a way to version the strategy. So if we update the client, then we also need to update the server, but we also need to make sure that the server and the, and the client match and that they use the same version. And if they don't, then we need some sort of mechanism to know if they use the same version or what version they can use. And we don't even know the version anyway. So this was very, very complicated. We needed to make the changes of our many version of Kubernetes. Any change required two or three releases uh, to make sure that we could propagate the change everywhere. And this was uh, very, very complicated. So knowing that this was never going to be the good solution anyway, we never implemented it for custom resources. Um, so that doesn't even work for custom resources. You can't, you can kubectl apply custom resources, but you miss a lot of the possibilities that are available to you if you're using a built-in type. Um, it also has limitations on the collaboration, to be honest. It's not solving all the use cases of collaboration that we had in mind. Uh, and specifically because the implementation, which is very complex, is specifically made in kubectl in Golang. And if you want to use any other language than Golang, there is no way for you to reuse the algorithm. You can maybe create a new process and fork to kubectl, but that's the only way. You can't easily create a tool or a library that is going to use apply if it's not written in Golang or if it's not using the kubectl binary. And that's really detrimental for the ecosystem. Um, one of the other challenge is that only one actor can apply. So because we have this annotation that says, this is the last thing that you applied, uh, no one else can come and use the same annotation, obviously, because they would just not agree. Um, so we could create maybe another annotation, but clearly, the people would take the chance and just override their fields constantly. If you have an opinion about a field and I have a different opinion about the same field, anytime I'm applying, I'm going to override your change. And anytime you apply, you're going to override my change. And we're going to keep fighting like this in a way that is uh, sometimes hard to detect. And sometimes, even if it's easy to detect, you might detect it because you've broken your cluster. Um, so the fields being overridden unintentionally is definitely a big problem for collaboration. Um, one very good example of that, again, using the replicas field, is that if you, let's say you created a deployment with uh, three replicas, and later on you want to use an HPA to decide automatically how many replicas you want. And let's say your system is very successful and you end up having a thousand replicas. And now when you apply your config, you actually apply three by mistake it's going to override this field, the 1,000 replicas, and you're going to end up with only three, which may very well break uh, the system and your customers' use cases. 
So that's actually quite a terrible bug that we want to avoid. Um, finally, one of the problems we had with, the, with this approach is, again, we didn't know exactly where we were going to end up when we started. And so because of this lack of systemic approach, there are many bugs that are very subtle and hard to fix. And an example, again, about these replicas, and take the same example, if you had this HPA set the number of replicas to 1,000, and you actually remove it from your config because you don't want to overwrite it. So you remove it from your config and apply. It's actually going to believe that you want to remove the replicas field. And the problem is when you remove the replicas field, it gets defaulted to one. So you break your customers anyway. So <laughs> there is actually no way or very, only very complicated ways to solve this problem. If you want to remove the replicas field, it's probably going to break something. And this is very complicated and unfortunate. So we invented server side apply, which is a new mechanism for uh, which is a new mechanism for applying uh, to a cluster. This works by removing every logic we have in kubectl and move it to the server. So literally, we're stripping kubectl from any apply logic, any merge logic, and we're moving it to the cluster with some changes. And so, what do we do? Uh, we created a new endpoint on the API server where you can send your intent and say, this is what I want and this is what I care about. Please do so. Uh, do not override anything that I'm not specifying in there. If I've removed anything, don't break everything, please. And the server is going to take care of all of that. It's very, very convenient because now you can write a client without doing anything. You just have to send the object. You just read the file send it to the proper endpoint, and it's going to be applied to the cluster. Uh, this, it's as easy as doing curl. Uh, curl send this file to this uh, specific URL, and boom, you have the file merged uh, on the server properly. Uh, we've been very careful to keep some uh, compatibility with client-side apply, and so you can still use these mechanisms and client-side apply at the same time. Uh, and this is still going to work. We're going to be very careful to maintain the last applied annotation as you do. Uh, and you can go back and forth so that, um, so that things still work the way you would expect. And if you want to go back and try one and go back to the other one, it's still going to work. So that's, I think that's a very good feature. How does that work? Well, because we want the collaborative approach, we've decided to create managers. So. Managers are actors of the system. We believe that configurations have many actors acting on the same uh, configuration, and we want them to work together well and prevent any problem that could happen if someone is trying to change a field that you have an opinion about. So each actor in the system has a name. Uh, as you can see on, this, uh, on the left, we have the manager who is kubectl uh, in this case. And each actor has a list of fields that they manage. It's actually not a list. Uh, we could call it a set. Um, it's a set of fields. And these are the fields that we believe you have an opinion about. So if you apply the configuration that we saw before, you're going to have an opinion about replicas. You're going to have an opinion about uh, the container image and the container name. Um, if someone else has an opinion about the same fields, you're going to get a conflict. So what happens is that um, if somebody, for example, the HPA has set the number of replicas to a different value, we are going to notice that they already care about that value. And so as you're trying to change the value of the field, we will send back an error saying, someone already has and manages this field. They have an opinion. Are you sure you want to change their value? Because that can be catastrophic if you do. And so the user has two options they can decide to uh, remove the value from their file, in which case they can then reapply and they're not gonna get a conflict because they literally said, yeah, indeed, I don't have an opinion about replicas anymore. Let, let the system decide. Someone else has an opinion. I trust them to have a better opinion than I, let them do it. Uh, or you can use the false flag, which is going to force the value. And in this case, we're literally going to take the value of replicas from the manage field of the HPA. We're going to take it from them and we're going to put it back in the fields that you manage. Um, one interesting feature, again, is the backwards compatibility that we want to maintain. Um, we can't 
start breaking things that work today in Kubernetes, including controllers. Um, it's difficult when there is an error in a controller to know about it and for a user to do anything about it. So controllers are always sort of forcing and they're not using apply anyway because apply is new. So, but even if they're not using apply and even if they're not forcing, we always accept their changes and we only detect that they have a change because we can look at the difference. So if the HPA changes just the replicas, it's going to own just the replicas. And we know that because it changed the value and whenever you change the value, it's because you have an opinion. And that's how we build the sets for uh, controllers and types that did not know about server-side apply or do not use server-side apply before. So we are co completely maintaining this backward compatibility with existing workflows. And we're just doing the right thing by detecting that uh, they have an opinion because they changed something. So now the question is how are objects merged? Um, we've tried to keep the logic as simple as possible. And by that, I mean, we literally take what you apply, we take the existing object and we put it on top. So any value that you specify is going to end up in the object and any value that you haven't specified is going to be kept the same. Uh, Obviously, one of the questions when we do that is how do you remove a field? Because if you remove it from your config and apply it, uh, well, it's not going to be removed. It's going to keep the current value. Uh, and so for that, we just remove the fields if nobody has an opinion about it anymore. So if no one has an opinion about replicas, we just remove it. Um, and what happens when a replica is removed, it goes back to, to one. Um, but it only happens if no one has an opinion. So if you remove it from your config, but the HPA has set a value, we are going to know, oh, well, the HPA still cares about that. Let's keep the value because we believe it's correct. Um, how do we keep track of who owns what? Uh, I've discussed it a little bit before. So for our controllers, we typically look at what has changed. Uh, when you apply, we look at all the fields that you have applied and we create a set, a mathematical set of all the fields that you care about. Um, and at that time, we look at all the manager sets in the list and we intersect them with your set. And any intersection that comes as non-empty shows the conflict. So we literally take all of these sets and we send them back to the user saying, you have an intersection with this other person, which means you care about the same field. Um, you need to do something about this. And as you could see before, we actually save uh, the name of the person and for some changes, we also keep the date so that we know when someone changed the field that you're trying to edit. So we can say, hey, uh, you're trying to change the field that the HPA has set uh, at this value. This is also very important for of the out of band changes. So let's say something is broken in your cluster and um, someone goes and connect and directly edits one of the field. Um, when you reapply, maybe you're going to override that value. And we obviously don't want to do that because if you do that, your cluster is going to break, right? Um, and so at that time, you're going to see a very nice conflict that says, you are trying to change this field set by this person. Are you sure you want to do so? And um, reasonably, you should ask yourself if this is what you actually want to do. Um, also, finally, this works for built-in types and custom resources. But we're really trying to make custom resources work uh, the way built-in types work. Um, and for that, we've tried to make everything look and behave as closely as possible. So if you are writing a custom type, all of this should work exactly the same way as it would if you had a built-in type. We don't want you to miss out on any feature. What are the benefits of that? Uh, well, so it enables the ecosystem uh, because it's so much easier to write apply um, that it's very it's much easier to write a, a new tool you don't have to write any 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 logic you just have to send the, the content to the api server so now if you want to write a tool it's 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 a few lines of code just to update the object which is a massive change compared to today where you had to either use go or use the kubectl tool make sure it's shipped properly that the version is right uh, this is much easier now um, obviously, the other change is that we are more collaborative. You have multiple appliers. 
Um, we are starting to convert some of the existing controllers to use this mechanism because we believe it has benefits and it's much easier to implement and maintain. Um, the uh, friendly user, uh, the friendly errors are uh, much better and prevent you from uh, breaking your clusters uh, accidentally. And of course, it improves the uh, human and machine collaboration because um, you can now change parts of the config while the machine changes other parts of the config um, without interacting with each other and without overriding the values that you don't want to override by accident. Now, um, now that we have that, so we know that we can apply a lot of configuration, but uh, I, I suspect you're soon going to realize that you have too many configuration files. It's, it's very common for people to wonder what to do with all of these YAML files. And I'm sure you've seen that before, you have too many YAML files. I've, I've, I've had this problem. And often you have one version of the file and you want to apply it for maybe a test environment, as I talked about before. The problem is that the test environment is not, not the exact same environment as the production. You want to use a different database, I mean, hopefully. Um, you have different requirements. You probably don't want as many pods. You probably don't want it to be deployed to the same place. There are many things that are actually different between the test environment and the product environment. And so you have very small variations between these configurations that can be already made of like many, many different files. And if you just want to change one value out of these many different configurations, you're going to have this problem. Um, and it starts very quickly. Even having two configurations is already too much for me. So I have this problem constantly. What we've made is that we've created customized because we believe it's, it's as close as possible to the principles that we've described in this presentation. We believe that customize is collaborative. Uh, it lets you share the configuration easily, but it's also data. So I still believe that the configuration should be da data. And this is very difficult because it's very, very tempting to use a programming language to abstract away some of this redundancy. Uh, but I, I suspect there is there is something wrong because as soon as the as the configuration becomes code, it's not possible to collaborate with machine. I, I do not believe that it's possible to have configurations written as code if you want machines to edit them. Um, so that's one of the big challenge that we have today. Uh, and customize is one of the uh, one of the solution, but it has other limitations. I know so many solutions exist. Uh, out there, but most of them do not treat uh, the configuration as data and as collaborative as it should be. And I think that's one of the problems that we we'll want to save, uh, we we'll want to fix for later. That's it for me. Uh, that's all I have for today. Thank you so much for listening. Thanks, Antoine. The apply action is so integral to the magic of Kubernetes declarative capabilities. By implementing Antoine's suggestions, we can help make sure our Kubernetes clusters are as scalable and easy to work with as possible. I know I'm going to review that on demand and probably live tweet it later. We've covered a lot of really essential topics to working with Kubernetes and regarding how Kubernetes itself works. Our next talk dives further into Kubernetes inner workings by focusing on a component that I know I struggled with when I was first getting started trying to understand Kubernetes. I believe it's also the most recent project in the Cloud Native Computing Foundation to achieve graduated status. But before we get to that, for a bit of interactive fun, we're sharing another poll. And this one is a bit <clears throat> controversial. Check it out and tell us how do you? pronounce the name of the Kubernetes command line tool. <laughs> and for our final talk before the after party, we'll hear from Yuchen Zhou about etcd. Take it away.
Hey there, welcome to the session about ICD. I'm Yu Chen. I'm a software engineer from Google, and I'm a contributor to ICD OSS community. After listening to the previous sessions about Kubernetes, I'm sure you have already have a very clear uh, or no overall knowledge and impression of Kubernetes. So finally, we'll reach to the backend data of the Kubernetes. So in this session, we'll have the exploration of ICD where the Kubernetes data rests. I'll give you an overview of architecture of SAD and some key components, which I think is very good to know. Here is today's agenda. First, I'll do the overall introduction of SAD to say what is SAD, and then I'll talk about the relationship between Kubernetes and SAD and say why does Kubernetes use SAD as a storage. And finally, let's have a deeper dive into the technical detail about how a say, SAD request lifecycle looks like. First thing first, what is SAD? From the website, official website of SAD, SAD is a distributed reliable key value store for the most critical data of a distributed system. The naming of SAD comes from two parts. The first part is SE. SC comes from the SC folder in Unix. D stands for the distributed. So it's very easy to understand why SD is designed for distributed system and storing the most critical data, like the configuration data. SD is an open source project. It has, uh, it has a rapid growth over the past five years. SD is a CNCF incubating project. It is adopted by many different projects, including Kubernetes, which is, of course, the most famous one. SD focuses on some key features. Here I listed th three of them, which I think is the most important. The first one is consistency. SD ensures strict serializability by default, which is strong consistency model. It means the operation appears to have occurred in some order, consistent with the real-time ordering of those operations. For example, if operation A completes before operation B begins, then A should appear to proceed B. The second feature is the high availability. The recommended SAD cluster sh should have more than three cluster members, and it is designed to replicate data among cluster members. SAD leverage of the consensus algorithm to provide strong consistency and high availability, which will improve the high fault tolerance by avoiding the failure from the single point or network partition. It is obvious if the cluster has three members, it will, uh, it will stand for the um, bigger video. SCD has a high usability. It is very simple to use. You can read or write data using standard HTTP or JSON tools, such as Curl. As a lightweight data store, it also has a, uh, it also has a good performance. Here is a benchmark for SCD in a reasonable rate. Actually, if you don't mind receive the possible style data in some condition, you can specify to use the serializable rate. It has better performance, but it just reads data from the local machine, which means it does not ensure consistency. But on the other, other hand, it, is, it has lower latency. SCD itself recommends to use the linearizable rate to, read, to ensure consistency. Consistency is one of the most important selling points of SAD. So how does SAD ensure the strong consistency? The first principle is that any action to take place has to be common, which means everything should be decided by the majority of the cluster. If the cluster has to remember two is the majority, so everything should be to be agreed among these two, at least. It is the reason why SAD suggests to use all the size cluster. As I mentioned above, SAD builds on top of the draft consensus algorithm. There are two rough algorithm properties that ensures consensus. Leader election is not one you may be familiar in Kubernetes. It is to make sure there's only one member in the cluster who can make decision. Other members in the cluster are followers. The leader needs to send out the heartbeats to his follower to keep his authority. The leader goes offline because of network issue. The follower will not receive his heartbeats. Then the follower will overturn the previous leadership and start a new leader election as a candidate. 
Basically, the customer should always have a leader or try to elect the leader. The customer will not serve the client request unless it has the leader. So sometimes the cluster has high leader change frequency. It will strongly reduce the performance of the cluster and also signal the potential network issue or excessive load. Log replication is another property of RAPT. Log replication makes sure only the leader can manage the replicated log and replicate its log to the followers. The replicated log, which is named as wall log, should be identical on each machine in cluster logically. But the most time, each cluster member can have different performance and some of them can lay behind. So wall log records the log that are committed on the majority machine. So for example, if you have a cluster with three members, wall log records the log that are at least committed on two of them. On the right, here is the architecture of the replicated state machine. The, firstly, the client will send the request, and the consensus model on the server will receive this request. The leader will manage the wall log and replicate the log entry to other followers. Then each cluster member will apply the committed log entry locally and respond to the class client. Even if we have the above mechanism, the cluster can still end up with corruption. The corrupted member is logically part of Coral, but the backend data is inconsistent with each other, which means the corrupted member is viewed as healthy by the peers, even if itself, but its backend data is unhealthy. Actually, it is allowed that the data on different members could have discrepancy at once because small machine has small, has different Different machines can have different processing speed. However, a strong consistent database should make sure the data at one revision number should be identical. Revision number is a important concept in, in SED. Uh, I'll mention it later in our later slides. Corruption check is built on top of this property. It does a hash operation and then they compare the checksum of each member at one revision. The checksum of the each member at one revision should be identical. To avoid regional cluster corruption, we need to corruption check periodically to make sure the disk data is consistent. It is very important. Here, let's move into our second part, SCD in Kubernetes. SCD plays an important role not only as a backend data store, but also for the server's discovery. Kubernetes makes use of SCD's watch operation to asynchronize monitor, uh, asynchronously monitor changes to reconfigure itself from actual to desired states. From the deployment perspective, SCD instances are deployed as pods on masters. In the regional Kubernetes cluster, like the picture shown on the right, it has three master nodes and each one has one SCD instance. And this three SCD instance can form as SCD cluster, which will communicate with each other uh, about the leader election or other message. So why SCD is important to Kubernetes? Firstly, it's because of the data storing functionality, for sure. SCD is designed to store the most critical data, and it has rather high performance, and it ensures strongest consistency. Secondly, the watch operation of SD makes Kubernetes easier to monitor the desired and actual state. If they diverge, Kubernetes make use make changes to reconcile the actual states and the desired states. Then let's have a deeper dive into the SD technical detail. Here is the SD architecture. Everything starts from the client. The client of SD server could be the SD cattle or the, uh, which is command line tool of SAD, or the API server of Kubernetes. The request goes through the client balancer and will visit one of the available nodes in the SAD cluster. Once the server receives the request, it will send out a proposal to the raft. Here we can just view raft as the black box, and the output of raft is that the same log will replicate in both files on the majority machine. The consensus is ensured since all nodes follow its wall log to apply the request. So, so the last step is that the nodes will apply the wall log one by one and the process to the disk. 
There are two official SD ports. 2379 is for client request, listening the request from the client. 2380 is for peer communication. A peer can use this port to communicate with each other and switch the messages. If you have noticed in last slide, the backend of SD is called MVCC Store, aka Multi Version Concurrency Control. SCD is designed to store infrequently updated data and provide reliable watch queries, which means SCD recommend to, SCD recommend to have a low, low read but more read. So SCD keeps previous version of the Kiwi pairs to, st to support an inexpensive snapshot and watch history events known as time travel query. That is the intuition we wanted to use MVC data model to address these use cases. The critical concept in MVCC is revision. Revision is cluster wide counter. It will increment each time the case space is modified, which means only put, delete, and the transaction operation will change the revision number. The range request, which is known as the read request, will not touch the case space, so it will not change the revision number. The revision is works like the logical clock. It makes sure every member in the cluster can keep pace with each other. Logically, data is stored in flat binary case space, which has multiple revisions. Physically, as it is stored physical data as KV pair in persistent bot DB. The key of this persistent tree is a revision pair composed by the store revision as the identity of each key in the same store revision. It is not the key from the request. Value is a key pair along with its data. If the if the client requests to got this to fetch this key pair, that is the thing which will be returned to the client finally. As a database system. SCD has a bunch of operations. Here, I only list the most important ones. The first tab is KV operation, the basic KV operation, which works on the SDK space. Range is the read operation, which can read a range of KV pair lexically. Put is a write operation, and transaction is atomic if then else construct over the key value store. A transaction can automatically process multiple requests in a single request. It is widely used in Kubernetes. Since the range and the pull are the most common and basic request, I'll explain more about the lifecycle of them. The second type is maintenance operation, including compaction, defragmentation, and snapshot. Watch is to monitor the change of the KV pair. List is to manage the temporary keys. In Kubernetes, it is used to auto-delete event resources. SD also has many has also has many other operations, such like the authentication operations, which is used for authentication and authorization. If you are interested in it, you can go to the website and read the official documentation. Here is the life cycle of the pull request. Firstly, V3 server will receive this request from SD client. It wraps the request and sends the raft request to the raft cluster. Then on each local member, they will apply the committed rough log entry to in-memory index tree, which maintains the logical view of SD and, and then writes the QA pair to persistent about DB. Inside a raft, it has these four steps. So if the if the follower received the rough if you save the rough request, it will forward it to this leader. Remember, only the leader can make the decision. The follower cannot make the decision. So that's the reason the follower will forward the request to the leader. Leader will decide whether to create or append a new log entry, and then it will replicate this log entry to the followers. Follower leader will keep in touch with these followers to make sure they also commit the log entry and then update the committed index after the majority has com committed the entry. After that, the, uh, the log entry will be applied into in-memory index tree and also the bot DB. As for the range request, normally it should go through the same process as pull request to make sure consistency. However, since it will not mutate the KV space, there is an optimization. 
Once a Wizard server receives the request, it will get the current read index and wait until the local store applies all entries before the read index and to make sure it is not stale. The read index is the committed index of the leader at the time the server receives the request, the range request. It stands for the latest days of the whole cluster. So once the local store is not updated, it is safe and fast to read the KV pair just from the local server. Now let's talk about the maintenance operation. I think people easily get confused on compaction and defragmentation. Both of them work on shrinking the SD, but the integration and the object are different. Compaction works on case space, and it is a linearizable operation which will be proposed to route. So why do we need compaction? Since SD keeps the exact history of its case space, we cannot let the case space grow without control. This history should be periodically compacted to avoid performance degradation and the eventual storage space exhaustion. So how does compaction work? Compaction will specify a revision. Why do you set it before this compaction revision, except the latest one will be removed? Compaction is done automatically by SAD server every a couple of periods or uh, every 10,000 log entry. But you can also request to do compaction yourself with a specific revision. Then the then the uh, data will be compacted on this specific revision. Defragmentation applies on bot DB. It is used to release the internal fragmentation back to the system. The internal fragmentation comes from the compaction operation, which is free to use by the backend, but it still consumes the storage space. Compared to compaction, defragmentation physically reclaims the space on disk. One thing we need to emphasize here is that the fragmentation will block the safe system from reading and writing data. So if you like the whole cluster to defragment at the same time, it will stop the work. So uh, do remember to not like the, to do it at the same time, or it will break the principle of high availability. Snapshot creates the durable backup on SD members that can database periodically. Compaction and defragmentation will remove the history. So on the other hand, the a snapshot will record the history and will be very useful to record some issue like uh, corruption issue. Snapshot operation is done locally, so each member in the cluster can have different snap snapshot for a specific time. However, do remember restoring the cluster from the backup will be dangerous because you may miss the data from the time you take a snapshot to the time to the current time. That's all I want to share about this SCD today. Uh, if you guys are interested in SCD, you can go to the website and uh, look at the official documentation, or you can download it itself and play with it locally. Thank you. Thank you, Chen. Et cetera D is one of those things that's easy to take for granted. For many, it just works. And that's a credit to the thought, design, and rigorous effort put into it by the uh, et cetera D maintainers. With that, OK, that's a wrap. And we're almost time for the after party. I do have one quick announcement, though, before we can kick that off. Today, we've launched a new video series, Learn Kubernetes with Google. We'll be covering a wide variety of topics. And we'll start with some uh, video series on the horizontal pod autoscaler. With that out of the way, we can, it's now time for the after party. I have a couple little small housekeeping items just need to cover first. We'll uh, send an updated Google Meet link to join the after party here in a sec. You'll be able to see a button on the agenda page. Uh, today's speakers will also be joining us and we'll have some quizzes and some other like fun activities and other things like that. I hope to see you all there.